story of the first Reykjavik Rankarina television was stationed in this house. There's a wall here, here's a stairway. I feel like I have to draw this from the beginning because this page is already messed up. I was sitting here, my brother was sitting here. We had a square tablecloth and I think we were eating special food Friday after school, after end of the week type of food because we weren't allowed to eat junk food. But on Fridays we, we had a, like a special a junk food. I, allowed to have just one item from the junk food box thing. Not a ritual, just a custom that dad created. There's a door here. Dad was sitting in the corner, Mom was sitting here doing some kind of crochet handwork. Both of them had glasses on. The time was somewhere between 4.30, 6.30. I believe it could have been a Thursday instead of a Friday, but it felt like it was like an end of school type of period, so that's why it was maybe a Thursday instead of the usual Friday. So I don't know if it was like an end of term or a school holiday or a public holiday, something like that, which uh, I remember feeling of maybe a bit like holiday time in the beginning, 4.30, 6.30. It was like a after school zone time on the television, but I don't know when the Leyland Brothers, what time it used to be on, but it was like an after school type of zone. So if I had access to archives, what time? I'm thinking of digging out. I mean, you find what time the Leyland Brothers might have been on. It was a show like the Leyland Brothers in corner B grade. But that was, I think it was the Leyland Brothers, or I'm not sure if it was a documentary that might have been around the time Leyland Brothers was screened or after the Leyland Brothers. I just remember the Leyland Brothers being one of those doco type of things in kind of B grade. B grade Australian production quality. The camera was focused on an indigenous community and it was the first time in my life I was hearing the language without any subtitles, no English t subtitles. And it was for a very prolonged duration. You know, each time the camera cut onto the indigenous tribe and they were speaking their language, there was no English. And that alarmed me because I wanted to know what they were saying. I wanted to read it and it alarmed me that language was being spoken without any guidepost. I have memory of some type of maybe they couldn't afford to write the subtitles included in the video or something like that. But the usual style of the Aussie landscape on television, there usually wasn't subtitled. It was dubbage. They just dubbed over the voices in English and I absolutely abhor that. That is disgusting. I find that utterly disgusting. It's vomit worthy. What a disgusting cult. And uh, yeah, that was the first time I experienced what at the time we would have just outright said this is Abbo. That was my first contact with an Aboriginal language. <sighs> And at the time, Aboriginal was a cultural identity, and I never saw it as a word like indigenous, which is what that word was in a dictionary. It was the first time I made contact with language from of this land that was not polluted by the sound of rot trying to suffocate it. It was the first time I got to hear the language without obstruction. So I was here. My brother was there. I believe my mum might have cooked fried chips for dinner. Potato chips and the potato. We had it with some tomato sauce and salt. Dad was in the corner reading something. Like sort of you know, totally chill. Mum, yeah, they both had their glasses on. I remember that. So they were kind of in your face, kind of occupied with stuff close in their face. Dad was reading. Mum was doing some crochet knit or something with her hands, working with her hands. I really want to continue drawing the picture here, but it's currently crowded at this mess. Perhaps um, the experience of hearing the language. Yeah, these are my eyeballs. And I'm not sad. I'm just confused. 
I'm confused. I'm kind of scared because the TV failed to give me English subtitles or English dub. I'm scared because I don't know what it means. Not really scared, but feeling kind of left out because I want to understand what the people are saying, but my ability to comprehend has been route road, train wreck. So I wasn't really scared, but stressed a bit. Dealing with the unknown, but confused as well. I got scared because I felt like something went wrong because I couldn't hear the English, but the sounds they were making were Turkish. They became Turkish. I couldn't understand how the fuck, what was going on here. Why are they speaking in Turkish? I couldn't understand that because they sounded like, it just sounded so much like Turkish. What the fuck? Outright Turkish, I was hearing Turkish, but I couldn't understand what it meant because my Turkish was compromised. I knew my brother's Turkish wasn't as strong as mine, and I felt stuck in trying to ask him, are you hearing any Turkish? Can you understand it? Because I knew the probability of him knowing what it meant was a lot lower than me. But I think I asked is that sounding Turkish to you? Can you hear any Turkish in that? And he's into, I already know that my brother didn't know. That's what I do remember clearly is my brother didn't know, didn't have the capacity to translate. And then needing to consult with my parents, asking why are they talking in Turkish? Like, uh, I couldn't understand why it's in Turkish. And my parents were doing, looking at each other, oh, what's wrong with her? There's nothing Turkish, this isn't Turkish. Like, they tried to listen to it, but their response was, oh, that's not Turkish, Aicha. And that's the, the beginning of the self-doubt. That's the shape of the self-doubt. I heard what sounded like direct, coherent, crystal clear Turkish. I was hearing Turkish. But I couldn't bridge meaning because they were speaking too fast and I, my mother tongue was compromised and I didn't have the capacity for translation. So mom and dad said that's not Turkish, I think we're just imagining it and then I believed them because suddenly the transmission just cut off very much like tuning into a radio exactly the same signal just uh, like the dial just went you're yeah, turning the dial just went and then i thought my parents were right because I, I couldn't hear the signal and then the the language just moved into something else and i couldn't hear it anymore but then the tuning dialed back in and it clicked back in and it came back so it was this on off on off sometimes it just went on and then off in hindsight, from what I know of it so far, quite possible the reason why I was hearing the Turkic drone come on versus switch off, wax on, wax off, would have been because there actually was a speaker in there. Uh, it would have been caused by a specific individual. That's why if Mimsy, if you can uh, find the actual episode or the actual show that featured that specific tribe on TV, during what was it 1984 86 but before 88 <sighs> yeah would be nice to re-listen to it if i could have anyhow in the instance where i'm correcting my estimation where that turkic tuning that made the signal wax on wax off wax on if that was caused by an individual speaker within their tribe that speaker is a multilingual and would have had connection to languages further north. And they were on the west side of the NJ divide, like me. They came from the west, the west of the Philippines. So uh, quite likely they knew Bahasa, Indonesian language, Malaysian, or their culture, their tribe, their language located in the top end. And that top end had extensive back and forth with the uh, land further north and on west of the NJ divide. I'm calling that the NJ divide. I'm west of it that obviously curls into China, possibly hugged by the Himalayas, that W, 
type of thing as well that would I can see the W working a little bit. There's the NG in Australia. I see it kind of it's a multi pronger. I should draw a better picture. Let's start that scratch. <laughs> <laughs> this my from Australia, that's a pretty bad one. Alright, there's the NG, there's the divider, and I'm west of it. Alright, now the NG migration is kind of on this half of the continent, but the division is not just a straight line. It's like the ant the nest, it's branched out, it's, it's got a, that kind of meander, it's got a meander dominating the eastern side. My stream that I'm coming from, the languages are kind of over here, however, some did manage to cross over and end up here on this side like that. In that instance, that's the language being transported by boat. It's not a natural passage with consent. It's, it's not with consent, that one. It otherwise wouldn't have naturally gone that way, I don't believe. It would have from its free will. Um, and I'm not quite sure of what the, the sea currents are like in this area. I'm not aware of them, but I would be examining is there any strong flow of current anywhere where if I were to just jump off the edge of this island up here by just treading water and not swimming anywhere is there any strong currents that will take me long distance naturally in this direction and I'm thinking yeah, if there is I am making a wild guess it's more likely to swing north not quite south east I kind of just see this passage, this type of passage where you've got this great divide that you shall not pass, where the ends of the world have finally met and kissed each other. Well, this type of crossover I don't perceive as being a completely natural journey, but it could have still shaped the outcome through wind patterns as well, where the boat sails, so therefore the wind would be uh, having some influence there. Yeah. Some languages move like that, but then there's these other ones that also traveled further, further south from the north. They have traveled somewhere where the further south they are, the capacity to comprehend the vowel tonnage is uh, the distance. I can feel, read the distance of that because my ability to comprehend and hear it, I can hear the signal becoming so there are languages here, but yeah, there's some others that end up in the New South Wales area as well. So in terms of being able to distinguish which indigenous languages live on this side versus which ones live on the side that, I've, that are closer to me, this is me trying to show that how it's not a simple case of let's just draw a straight line like that. It's got this ant's nest meander. It's done this sort of spaghetti noodle thing. So, more likely this top end towards the west, but there's gonna be lingos that have meandered. And they have also intermingled. But anyhow, my experience of the recall, when I hear it, it's uh, without question. I'll hear it very clearly and it'll be very immediate. I am able to recognize it through Roman. <laughs> Romance. Romance. <laughs> through the Latin, I can see it through the typography. Um, but I'm also able to detect it through the accent and what that sounds like through English. So it's possible to hear it through English. I can't remember. At what point did I try to explain my fr frustration of here are doing this bloody hi my name is how are you and this is how to speak it this is the sound you have to produce to communicate these concepts this is where English can be used as a diagnostic tool to help people find each other because of English being a dominant language here. How you can do that, how I do that, easy. Start doing this. One, two, three.
You do that. Just go through the sequence. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. In your primary language, do the same thing. In your mother tongue, your other tongue. But what you should also do is speak it with the accent of your parents. How your mum would have said it. How your dad would have said it. How your grandma would have said it. Carry the accent. And that's how you can find others who are from your same soundscape i'd like to say family but yeah vom vom would be like a van yeah vom vom not so much a one <laughs> vom two three the they can't pronounce the th easy and the syllable becomes a multiple three four five six seven seven Sal one, just like the count on Sesame Street. <laughs> Sal one, a yet, a yet, a yet, a yet, a yet, nine, 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 ten, 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 ten. The ten is not a solid. There's multiple. With that particular, with the 10, there's a multiple. If my accented version of 1 to 10 sounds close to how your parents would have spoken, fucked it on this land, yeah, your language is close to mine, more likely to experience recog that is more dense rather than the sporadic every now and then. And for me, when the cognition is multiples and multiples where it's just constant, as I experienced it on the television that day with the indigenous lingo. When it happens, when this density is really large and the recog is happening in super large chunks and I'm getting full on actual sentences where I can't understand the meaning but the passage of the sound is just unmistakably Turkish to my ear. The proximity, your proximity of your language is closer to me. And where I'm coming from, we have shared the same passage. We've traveled the same terrain. We've had a common passage and we probably have shared similar same turf. So hope that might offer a showage. I'm trying to show how I've experienced it with that. I don't forget that one. After that day, I kind of forgot about it for about 30 years. I can't do it tonight. Sorry. Yeah, I gotta drive. Maybe when I'm back from Sydney, is that alright? Yeah, look here. Look. Well, let's make you happy, cunt. Here's my pussy sitting on my telescope. Here I am grabbing it by the pussy. <laughs> I've got to go to bed. <laughs> Get in here!